Hello, 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 welcome back to my huge channel, everybody. Today we're talking about an amazing topic that I'm emotionally, physically, and in all other senses attached to. I'm speaking about Nicolas Gasquet, Louis Vuitton, and it's 10 years of Nicolas Gasquet, Louis Vuitton. And we're going to talk about references, we're going to talk about design, we're going to talk about Nicolas Gasquet himself, and to make this all more interesting and funny, because we already used our brain cells, before in a video that you can watch here again where I talked about Nicolas Gasquet in detail. I even made a video about it years ago because he is a designer we need to talk more about and we don't do it enough. But today I want to talk specifically about misconceptions, about his design references, what he means, what he is like and to support me on this amazing trip I have another French person here. As you might remember, I think it is important to ask a French person what he thinks about Nicolas Gasquet without having read in too many books of Nicolas Gasquet references and design, what the influence is on, on French design overall as well, and what is the opinion of a person overall about Louis Vuitton. I think that's super interesting and it's like asking random people on the street what they think about, except for the fact that this is a person that represents the whole of France for me. So if the answers are not correct and I will have seven to eight questions and they're either true or false, because this is a game and we love games, but we all, what we also love mostly about games is to have a winner. So if he's not correct with his answers, we're gonna end it the French way. Um, with a guillotine. And you know what? One more disclaimer before I start this whole game of truth or false of Louis Vuitton is I think it's super important to talk about Nicolas Gasquet also as a person, not only as a creative director, because I think he has something that is very unique about him that we don't see with many creative directors because we're in the era of like popular culture somehow. So this means you also need to market yourself. And I think a lot of designers nowadays are amazing in marketing themselves. Whereas when it comes to Nicolas Gasquet, I don't see him marketing himself ever. That's why I say we need to scream out this name more often. He's not mystifying himself. He's not iconizing himself. He doesn't bring out these weird bold statements that can easily turn you into this icon status that you have where you have like a big followership on TikTok because it turns into a sect. There are certain brands, you know what I talk about. And it's okay, I mean, we can all coexist. But I think what is really precious about Nicolas Gasquet and specifically is that he's so humble, that he's so subtle, while still being so striking when it comes to design, while still being so influential and not talking about it. And of course, there are interviews with him, but the way he speaks and explains everything just shows that it's giving you a bit the Mucha Prada vibe where, where they see just fashion as a vehicle to, to give people joy and not as a fundament to pose for themselves and show what they can create. It's really like more for the people. And this is one of the attitudes of Nicolas Gasquet I love the most because it's so humble yet so immensely creative. And I feel like nowadays a bit, if you don't scream out loud, if you don't bring out a collection that upsets people because it's so extreme and so edgy, it's kind of, it feels like you're not relevant anymore. While those that create amazing things and wearable daily looks that are amazingly daily looks are not being talked about. So it's not that Louis Vuitton is not a brand that nobody talks about. I think it's the most mentioned brand in the world. But still, I wanted to make this clear about Nicolas Gasquet. Like, it, the ones that scream the loudest are not always the best, just, just to keep that in mind. So what I did here now today is I picked some random facts, some more important than the others, some very, very random, which I still adore because we love random facts about the people we love. And I'm going to ask my friend here what he thinks about these statements and what he knows about their truthfulness, because they're either truth or false. If you know what the answer is or if you just want to participate, Leave a comment when I speak. Uh, I will, of course, say it after every statement, but leave down below your comment what you think is true or not. And I'm sure you know pretty much everything. I'm sure, I'm sure you know, guys, but uh, leave it down below what you think. And of course, if you haven't done that yet, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Uh, I really appreciate that and I'm a super happy little fashion girly if I see your subscription. I also have a Patreon now where I upload even more videos. You have like double the content that I usually create. So you can uh, join my Patreon and what I love most is of course my Discord that you can join. We're almost 2000 people. 
I keep it for free. I want us to be a big fashion community where we can exchange everything from city recommendations to daily looks to your unboxings to anything. Like we have everything there and I think it's a beautiful community and I love to see it thrive and it's like a field of flowers and we are the flowers. Uh, no, I think it's super rare to find very honest and sincere people that are not pretentious. Uh, pretentious people are not allowed, we're just very honest there. So if you're an honest person, join the Discord, the links are down below. So we're starting with statement number one. It's This might part opinions, part some worlds like Moses did. Um, one comment, one important statement. Nicholas Gasquier's despite popular belief really being pronounced Nicholas Gasquier the way I do it since the last three years and not Nicolas Gasquier because he actually has German heritage. So what's the French master's populations, Napoleon Bonaparte's mind and opinion about this? C'est faux. It's pronounced Gasquier. C'est faux? Yes, c'est faux. It's Nicolas Gasquier? Yeah, it's Nicolas Gasquier. So, yes, that's actually true. Um, I just wanted to make this as a pre-statement, actually, because I've been saying Nicolas Gasquier for several years now, and I really didn't want to be disrespectful, but I really didn't know it any better. And there are even some Reddit-like conversations where people are like, no, you can also say Gasquier when there's an H after the G. I heard from several French people now, it's it's Gasquier. And I watched a lot of interviews and he says Gasquier. So it's Nicolas Gasquier. So it, yeah, one point for, for France. Next question. And this is not a question. These are statements, sorry. The next statement. Jonathan Anderson and Simon Jacques Mus learned under the creative direction of Nicolas Gasquier. Just uh, as another uh, disclaimer, this is a fashion person in front of me but who is not aware of a lot of details concerning Louis Vuitton. So I just wanted to ask this, like, what do you know? And we're all going to learn together. This is amazing here. Um, I would say no, because from my record, I think uh, Simon Paul Jacquemus um, uh, actually uh, was doing something on his own for a long time and didn't work for Nicolas Gasquier. Am I right? Yeah, he's right. Of course he's right. Pros would have immediately denied the statement. He took a few seconds though. But good, that's a good point. Simon was always on his own kind of. I don't know if he ever worked for another brand. But there are some seeds out there that you see on the market that are following not the footsteps, but they're definitely strongly influenced by their teacher and master. Nicolas Gesquier, and we see one of these people at Paco Rabanne, it's Julia Dosena, who learned uh, under um, Nicolas Gesquier at Balenciaga, and another very famous designer who is Natasha Ramsey Levy. Uh, she also worked under him at Balenciaga. Later, she had a very influential time at Chloe, as you might know from 2017 to 2020. And it's very funny because I think she is collaborating now with APC, who's also the very first internship she ever did in her life. So she started as an intern and I think she has some art direction or something there. So these two people also learned from Nicolas Gasquian. If you look at the Paco Rabanne collections, you will see definitely some influence. It's of course going into a different direction. It's a bit more, I would say, youthful, a bit more eclectic. And it's a different, not quality, but texture wise, of course, a different level and a different audience that Paco Rabanne targets. But it's nice to see that there are still some other designers that follow up on this. So Nicolas Gasquier definitely had some influence on young designers. Next statement. Nicolas Gasquier interned with the age of 14 at the label Agnes B that was already globally active. Uh... Oh, putain, c'est dur. Um... No, putain, this is a putain free channel. Um... I, okay, um, it's wrong. It's false uh, because um, the only the only way I would get this answer right is just by French regulation. You cannot work until you're 16. I could be wrong. Zong, yeah, you're wrong. Nicolas Jasquier literally interned with the age of 14 
at Agnes B. <laughs> I don't know, you're right, legally, I have no idea. Probably it he was, he yes, interned. he did, he interned, he interned. But oh, like, okay, but with 14, I was probably reading like some fantasy books with 14. I don't know what you've been doing, but definitely not thinking about my future. It's crazy. And later he had his probably maybe more influential internship at Jean-Paul Gaultier. It's funny because everybody, I don't know why, like everybody went through the school of Jean-Paul Gaultier, like Martin Magella, Glenn Martins, Nicolas Jasquier, like, yeah. So he interned very early and I just picked this statement because I was shocked when I read it because... Yes, of course, all successful designers have this thing for like starting very early, being very early, super passionate about everything already. But like 14, like how can you be so early so good? He was probably amazing. And to be honest, Agnes B, I mentioned it in a few other videos. Agnes. Agnes? Ah, yeah, that's oh, Agnes. I'm so sorry. I was raised in Germany. Okay, guys. So it's, it's okay if I do that sometimes wrong. Agnes, I mean... Anyway, okay. Uh, Agnes B, okay, uh, is a very interesting brand, actually. I think it's also a bit underrated. So if you like minimal, like this artistic and like high quality approach. Um, yeah, that's not how we speak here, okay? It's not very dead. And by the way, they have one of the coolest stores in Paris. So if you're in Paris, check the store. I think it's very atypical for Paris, which makes it amazing. Very modern, very... Uh, it's actually an old post office. Okay, he does know some things. It's actually an old post office. Wow, you have enlightened us. That's why it looks cool. And it's actually in front of the Palais Galliero. So if you're wow. fashion head in Paris, pass by Palais Galliero and go shop at Agnes B. This is an Agnes B stan account now. Next statement. In his childhood, Nicolas Jasquier loved equestrian sports. Up to this day, his designs are strongly influenced by equestrian sports. Ah, I think this one, this one it would be it would be correct, because I think um, there is a, a strong he has a strong influence from Baroque, and from back then, as you know, the people were only using uh, horses as the main vehicle to go around France. So I would say yes. That's correct. He is strongly influenced by equestrian sports and I don't know if it's the historical effect. I think definitely because we see a lot of like Baroque and Renaissance influences as well, as well as futuristic ones, because if you're aware a bit of the designs of Nicolas Casquet, you know he loves anachronisms, which means he loves contrasting periods paired together in a single look. One of the most emblematic to me is always the 2018 collection. I think it's spring summer where he has his frocks and sneakers combined. I I loved it. I think it's a, the modern form of back to the future. So yeah, he was doing himself equestrian sports and we see that very often. I think it also fits very well with the Louis Vuitton identity as well. I mean, they started with trunks, but I mean, the era where it started, as you said, is also like an era where horses were essential. And you see it also in the silhouette very strongly, which is like, he likes bold shoulders. He likes a tighter waist. And then it's sometimes either it's cropped uh, a bit like oh, for the jockeys or it's turning into a peplum. So you definitely have this, this feeling of wearing a uniform uh, jacket that you can see, for example, people doing horse riding. Also, and sometimes with hats, which makes me very happy. So this is probably, the next statement is probably one of my favorites because when I read it, I, I just loved it. So I wanted to turn it into an intricate statement in my passage. When Nicolas Jesquier had a meeting with Bernard Arnault before being acquired as a creative director, so after Balenciaga, they sat together and Nicolas Jasquier had to prepare something, a bit like a visual output of his creativity, a bit probably something like a pitch maybe. They didn't call it a pitch, but that's what I assumed. Nicolas Jasquier goes home and starts collecting all Louis Vuitton things, sketching, and we see the little petit mal that we know from the runways now. But the first time Bernardo saw it, he was not very convinced of a miniature form of the trunks that they had as a handbag. What do you think? Wrong, wrong. I think Bernard loved it. Why? Because it's a DNA of the brand. I'm sure he immediately saw potential. A miniature version, it's, it's, it's everything. Uh, when we, in, in France, we say, to ski a petit et mignon. 
which which literally means uh, uh, everything that is small is cute. I'm sure. Aww. I'm sure Bernard loved it. So you're right. It's correct. He loved it. Um, I think it's an amazing idea that Nicola Josquia had there, by the way, to create. You know, in the, the 2014 collection still had the hard covered bags, but now in the Fall 24 collection, for example, we saw the slutchier ones that I adore. But yeah, and you know what Ben Arno said? Uh, that's also very funny and I think very emblematic for him. He said that will look amazing in the stores, you know? He was immediately thinking of merchandising because he's the businessman. And I think it was a Times interview where I read this and Nicola just cares just like, yeah, um, I'm not a businessman. I don't know how it is staged in the store or something, even though, of course, he has a he knows exactly how to stage things if you look at the shows. But he said, like, I'm not a businessman. I don't know. But the first thing Ben Arno said was, this, this will look amazing in merchandising if we have multiple of these bags. So you really see, like, the difference of creative and merch. But I think it worked very well. And I think the bag is still amazing. And it's, it's super cool to have this as a first bag. And I think it's interesting because he's very... I mean, we know how good Nicola just gets when it comes to handbags. Uh, if we think of the city bag at Balenciaga, and I think he managed to create this for Louis Vuitton, which is super cool. So yeah, everybody's happy with the Petit Mal. Cute. Did I make it too easy? I think I was too convinced by speaking, right? I should have said it a bit more like I'm questioning myself. Two more and then we're done. Looking at the global resort collections that are held in spaces like Bob's House in Palm Springs, Monaco's Palace Square, and many museums in Brazil, Japan, and the French Riviera, it is obvious that Nicolas Gesquier has a thing for buildings of only the Renaissance and of Baroque times. This is right, because as I mentioned earlier, I know he has a strong influence from Renaissance and Baroque, so to me it makes sense. And you don't talk about Renaissance and Baroque without talking about architecture. The beautiful architecture you have around Paris, or around Europe. Right? C'est vrai? No. Ce n'est pas vrai. So, that, I did it on purpose, and I'm sorry. I mean, you're not aware, it's okay. But as much as he loves Renaissance and Baroque, it's not all Renaissance. He's also inspired by like ancient things, whatever, and also very modern things. But he likes to choose very modern buildings and surroundings to show his collections. Very modern, like very Bauhaus, very brutalist, very space age futuristic, usually. Yes, usually the pieces are shown in like very contrasting surroundings. And it's weirdly not that contrasting because they still fit very well. Traditional, but it's always like modern art and it's always modern. And he has a very big sense for architecture. Like he has a very intricate sense for architecture. And I love that this is relevant for Louis Vuitton, Nicolas Josquier, because of course it's also a question of budget to show in certain places, especially in Brazil, which is one of the most beautiful Oscar Niemeyer buildings and one of the most beautiful buildings overall. I think there are not many buildings that create that kind of dynamic because it's like staged in the middle of nature. Uh, but I think it's beautiful that he chooses these places because he could also choose uh, the Grand Palais every time. But we see really that he loves the clash and this is what makes it so exciting every time. Last question. The 10 year anniversary show that we just saw in March his, yeah, 10 years at Louis Vuitton, he was referencing a lot of his own collections. It was a bit like a birthday celebration of everything he has ever done. And they're all only referencing Louis Vuitton era designs. He was 14 years at Balenciaga, but we see in his anniversary collection only, very strongly, Louis Vuitton only references. Okay, this one I know. Um... 100% sure he referenced everything he's done uh, because you cannot just simply cut off uh, all your work. It's your DNA and he's, he's been doing, uh, he's been designing for decades now. Yeah, I think this one is correct. So yes, that's correct. He is obviously referencing his whole design career in this 10 year anniversary of Louis Vuitton collection. As you said, you cannot really cut off what you've d done before and it's cumulating work. So if you created something 25 years ago, the results of what you're seeing now is still based on what you did before. So that's why we see a lot of Balenciaga references as well here, which I think is amazing because we see that 
he keeps continuing reclaiming his identity and he has a very distinct design. Even though I said it's very subtle when it comes to his design, it's very easy to recognize also. I mean, we, sp we spoke about equestrian design, but this is just like one feature. We saw a lot of looks. We saw like the fur gloves. We saw the neoprene-like dresses. We saw the Victorian coats, the frocks, the handbags. So there were a lot of things referencing Balenciaga and also early Louis Vuitton years, not so early, even 2018 Louis Vuitton years. And I think that was beautiful because I think we need a retrospective after this. And I hope, I really hope LVMH is pushing to do a Nicolas Jasquier retrospective because that show and being at that show personally, to be very honest, was one of the most emotional fashion moments. It was probably the most emotional fashion moment for me because He's really a designer that I adore so much for the details. And I was so happy that this show also got the recognition it deserved so much. I mean, I'm not saying it, it was lacking before the recognition, but this time I just saw everybody's eyes and everybody cheering up and all these positive reviews. And I was just so happy that finally everybody sees what I've been seeing all along somehow. And we saw like this shape coming back and... The thing is, um, of course, the Balenciaga era has been so influential throughout the whole design world so much. And people are having archives of the Balenciaga era because the Louis Vuitton one is just more current. So that it's still more available. And all these collectors, archive collectors, fashion critiques, seeing these things come back again reminded everybody of the very strong 2000s of him. And it was a bit like a come together, you know, it was like a warm come together with Nicola and what he created and was so beautiful. So many people got emotional because you saw these beautiful pieces again on the runway. And that was amazing. Um, the very interesting thing here was like this collection. And of course, you can say a collection that is referencing too much is referencing too much. But I think we are not speaking about a designer that has that has five years of experience and does does like an anniversary collection. We are speaking of 25 years of hard work and so many pieces you need to imagine we have almost 60 looks for every main season plus resort and this for 25 years um there's so much design that should not be lost and i love a good referencing i love picking up and reclaiming what you created and bringing it back and showing it also to the younger new audience that is not yet aware of you i mean i know balenciaga back then but the kids nowadays don't and they need to be aware of it. And that's why it was such a beautiful show. I'm not even speaking about the setup. The setup was insane. Like I've never seen something like this before. It was so beautiful. It was so modern. It was emotional. It was striking. It was electric. It was futuristic. It was historical and earthy. It was everything. So this is about it. Um, I hope you liked this this way. I think I, I just wanted to make it a bit more interactive because I don't want to have just my monologue here and I think it's cool and I hope you left your comments so let me know what you were thinking or if you knew everything all along. I tried to make it a bit more commercially friendly otherwise you could have gone very niche guys and I know some of you would have knocked us out but it's not about that. It's about family and caring and everybody being able to participate. So if you like this video don't forget to subscribe of course. Join my Patreon. I'm, I'm doing a lot of personal things as well uh, on Patreon. Personal, not as OnlyFans personal. More personal, like I'm showing you my wardrobe. Let's talk about personal style. Let's talk, let's talk about your style. I'm really pushing that and I hope I can connect with you guys. And of course, the Discord, the very precious one-of-a-kind Discord. I think, and I heard that very often, it's one-of-a-kind, not comparable, smartest people, funny people, cool people, diverse people. I just feel like home. And that's what internet is supposed to bring in 2024. Feeling like home. So, love you.